So, Dr. Harmon, Dr. Gaziz, take a look. I think it's pretty good. All right. So I guess uh, you guys, uh, I guess this is not the first time you're seeing this uh, disease problem. I mean, the answers are very good. Okay, stop sharing. Right, so um, let me share my screen one second. I have some slides that I want to present to you guys. Can anybody see it? Good. All right, so um, this is uh, the some photos uh, from uh, home, one homeowner association oasis in Homestead. Uh, we did this uh, photo set with um, uh, Victor Gonzalez from Helena. Uh, you can see uh, since December 2018, so we are having this problem since 2018 here in Miami Dade. So we're talking about five years. And you see over there um, the grounds, uh, you can see some in 2018, some early stage symptoms. 2019, you see some uh, everything is green. And sorry, the slides are not very clear as if it's small. Uh, the, it's green because uh, they have a lot of weeds over there. It's not San Agustin grass, it's mainly weeds. Uh, 2020, you can see some dead, dead patches over there. Uh, and 2022, uh, you can see uh, it's green, but it's not San Agustin grass. It's mainly, uh, mainly weeds. Um, people are okay with that in that homeland association, but any, every homeland association is different. And this is more, uh, John is going to talk about this one. Uh, but the uh, homestead is uh, is very uh, a lot of problems with little viral necrosis over there. Uh, of course, mower machines are the, the the equipment that the people use to mow the grass. And the problem with this one is that this is the the culprit. I mean, this is uh, mower machinery, and you're going to see Dr. Phil Harmon and Dr. Romina Garcia are going to talk about this one here. You can spread the virus with this machinery. So the question is, uh, you know, how you can prevent the virus to be spread? And this is the, the people are, you know, they don't want to clean the machinery. They don't want to disinfect the machinery. It's too much time involved. So it's a challenge uh, to, to do this uh, type of management. Early stages of little virus. Uh, this is a property I visited uh, last year. You can see that spot over there. And this is, I think was in January, February. This is one you're going to see the, the problem, more symptoms over there. Um, so now you can see a little late stages. You can see you know open open field over there. That means that the grass is is, is dead. Uh, following with that, that uh, weeds are going to colonize uh, the area. So late stages, you can see it's, it's totally dead over there. Uh, so of course, uh, the homeowner has the, to take the decision I mean, to replant it, to resod it. Uh, in many uh, homeowner associations, the community, uh, you, need to you need to replant it. There is not too many choices. So it costs a lot of money to, to, to replant it San Agustin grass. So choices, I mean, many people, uh, you know, if I say to the guy, well, you need to uh, to blow the mower. Some guys say, well, I, can, I don't have time to mow the blower. You need to sanitize the, the machinery. I don't have the time to, to sanitize. So it's a challenge, I mean, and uh, the, home, the, the owner of the property, they need, to, they need to be a little more diligent, I mean, if you know that the mowers machinery are the one that caused the problem, maybe you need to ask the landscape company to to do the a, a better job, you know, do the cleaning or do doing the the blowing. Some companies are using this uh, little guy, uh, <laughs> this uh, electric uh, type of mower. Uh, 
in nowadays uh, you can find this uh, for commercial use so you can find a big machinery for commercial use so if you have a, a huge homeowner association maybe that's a solution you know these uh, little guys uh dedicated only to to your association so so these machineries are only full time in your in your in your in your yard or in your association so you can maybe it's, it's one way to deal with the problem another another uh, uh homeowner associations are more um a yeah, strict type of law, so they are killing all the, the grass that is affected. So you round up with the herbicide, you kill everything, and you start it from zero again. That's another choice, but again, costs a lot of money. Another choice is, uh, I hate this type of choice, uh, artificial grass. So many homeowner associations are changing natural grass for artificial grass. Uh, for me, it's a, it's a no-brainer. I mean, all the cons that this artificial grass has, temperature, environment, um, soil, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, um, I mean, that's, that's a no. The cons are more than cons than pros, but it's an it's a alternative that many people are using, artificial grass all over, all over, all over, you know, the county and in many, many places. So um, anyway, um, this is my info over there. Uh, John, can you, you want to start with this? Yeah, do you want me to go ahead and just uh, share like where I left off or do you wanna, you want me to go ahead and- uh, You want here. to share? Whatever. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, right where we left off here. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the uh, the human side of having to deal with this. Um, you know, it's very catastrophic for a lot of people. Um, and unfortunately, uh, I mean, Dr. Gazis and, uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Harmon are going to go into detail uh, in terms of trying to show uh, like the, all of the management strategies, all of the science behind it. But I'm gonna go ahead and, and just give you guys just a, a very basic uh, cover of like what it looks like here. And so you can see that this is, this is the key to IDing it. Um, is you can see this, this is the mosaic type pattern that we think of. Um, if you look at the the modeling that's uh, that's on the leaves, and IDing it is key, and a lot of places like they know very well that they're inundated with it. Um, parts of southern uh, uh, Palm Beach County, in particular, are heavily uh, impacted and like have been going you know more than ten years in terms of having like infections for their St. Augustine grass. So this photo that I'm showing you right now is a community, uh, I believe it's uh, Valencia Lakes that has decided to take a very aggressive strategy in terms of managing uh, their their turf. And on the left-hand side is the, the uh, you can see this is Floritam, it's, it's impacted. You can see the browning spots where it's starting to succumb. And then on the right-hand side here, you've got Citra Blue, which is what they've chosen. So Citra Blue and Palmetto are the cultivars. If you want to stick with St. Augustine grass, uh, these are the ones that have come up as the most commonly available ones that are on the market and have the ability to withstand uh, the virus. So, and, and you can see it, it's looking pretty overall healthy here on the, the right-hand side. And here's just a more up-close perspective of it. Um, of if you know the, the 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 side of the road, the left hand side of the road that it has the Floritam, and the right hand side that has the Citra Blue. So Citra Blue and Palmetto are the two big ones that are holding up. And you can see this is even while we are going through this particular community, 
they were putting, they were installing Citra Blue all over the place. And so like this was their strategy. Um, your mileage may vary in terms of if you decide to keep the Floritam on site, but and the, the prognosis is just usually very, very poor over the next few years. In general, you're going to be seeing uh, the death of the, the turf in a pretty short amount of time on most sites. And so this is, these are some pre-trial um, type things that are going on where they're looking at cult different cultivars and their performance. Um, and I think that this is stuff that Dr. Kenworthy and Dr. Harmon are, and uh, Saw Solutions are working on. Uh, and I think that they want to expand this hopefully as well to see, um, you know, a different variety or different cultivars, how they perform and under different environmental conditions in South Florida. So we get a lot of uh, feedback from you all in terms of what, you know, what's going on. Does this, does this uh, virus live in the soil for a long time? Can I sanitize my mower? How easy can I do that, et cetera? There's, we're going to answer a lot of these, uh, the, the experts here, Dr. Harmon and Dr. Gazis. But if you're looking for the resources in, in written form, we've got it already here. If you look at this link with the QR code, um, if you just go to this site, this is our, our frequently asked questions um, site that through the Palm Beach County, and it covers all of this information. But there is one question that is very um, difficult for us to answer. And a lot of people, and it, and it might not even come across as a question a lot of times, it's just more of like how people are feeling, but why is this happening to me? And it's very upsetting when this occurs. I mean, different uh, communities and homeowners associations have different rules and different levels of coverage in terms of uh, how much, uh, basically responsibility for the lawns and a dead lawn uh, might, whose responsibility that might incur. And a lot of times it is up to the individual to replace it. So unfortunately, uh, I mean, you just have to accept it. There's, I, I, I'm currently unaware of there being lawn insurance for these types of things. So you're looking at probably, if you want to, to deal with this problem, it, it is going to be potentially uh, a monetary incursion on your part. And, 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 you know, a lot of people get emotionally tied up to their lawns as well. They like coming here oftentimes from other parts of the country and having a nice green lawn all throughout the year. And it's, it's very distressing to come in and that it's, it's just going to be brown and only becoming increasingly brown. And in if you have a Floritan lawn. So that goes to shock and denial. A lot of people say, no, it's probably something else. We can help you with that. If we really wanna see what's going on there, we can send this, these samples up um, to Dr. Harmon. Um, he's got the, uh, and the, uh, the turf, rapid turf diagnostic center. And, and if they, we really need to try and diagnose it, there's the various uh, RNA and uh, PCR type tests that are available. And then if it if it all comes back positive, you're probably going to be upset because that's basically confirmed the worst case scenario. But uh, eventually, you just have to try and accept it, and then like we'll 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 work with trying to get you to that phase, and then we'll talk about the various remedies or courses of action that are, are available to you. And it's it's it can be kind of upsetting, but it's just the reality is that it probably is going to mean switching over to some kind of plant material, whether it be a ground cover or other species of turf or uh, other cultivars of St. Augustine. There are options out there for your lawn to look nice and um, for you to still get like the nice aesthetic value, environmental um, value from your, your yard. So just we want to leave you here at the end. Um, here's our resources again. Here's the UF IFAS article from Dr. Harmon. Um, we've got a whole site dedicated to various resources that we're, we're in the process of updating from Palm Beach County. And then also your county extension. If you just Google whatever your county name is and then like extension office after that, you'll be able to find us. So, and we'll, we'll, be, we'll gladly talk to you in more detail about the problems that you might be having. 
So let me go ahead and stop sharing. I guess it's it's back to back to you, Henry. You want to introduce uh, our next speakers? Uh, thank you, John. So yes, the next speaker is going to be Dr. Phil Harmon. Uh, again, she, he's the plant pathologist uh, uh, department uh, chair, and also he's the director of the Rapid uh, Truckgrass uh, uh, Clinic. Uh, he's a guy to go. I mean, he has some, so many years of experience working with this uh, disease. So thank you very much, Dr. Harmon, to be here. Thank you, Henry. Thanks for the invitation, uh, setting this meeting up and the, and the introduction there. My name is uh, Phil Harmon. Uh, are you guys able to see the slides okay? Everything good there? All right, awesome. I'm an extension specialist uh, in Gainesville, but I have statewide responsibility for turf grass across the state of Florida. Um, and today I'm going to talk about the viral disease that we've been uh, mentioning here called lethal viral necrosis uh, and a second disease that's related called mosaic and the virus that causes both of those diseases, sugarcane mosaic virus. And I'm gonna review some of the research that we've done uh, that explains what this is, what the problem is, why it occurs, what are some of the solutions that we have available for us, um, and, then, um, and then turn it over to Dr. Gaziz, who's gonna talk about ways to identify this problem in the lawn and the diagnostic steps that we take to be able to confirm that what we suspect might be mosaic or lethal viral necrosis is. So uh, to start with, I wanna say that I have other authors on here. Some of this research is being conducted is also being conducted in addition to Dr. Gaziz by Brom Dillon at Fort Lauderdale Research and Education Center. Uh, Dr. Wang and Kenworthy are in the agronomy department. I'll be presenting research uh, that's happened over the last 10 years that's gotten us to where we are now and our understanding of what this is, what we can do about it, and uh, what are our options for maintaining our, our Florida lawns? And so um, mosaic disease is, is not a new thing. It's something that's been around in the state of Florida for a long time that really didn't cause us a lot of headaches. We'll talk about the new development of lethal viral necrosis over the last 10 years that has been a major concern. It's very important for us because it's killing our lawns. And there are very few things that we can do outside of what John had mentioned uh, in replacing our grass with different varieties or different species, different uh, plantings altogether. So we will briefly review symptoms, the importance of this disease and what it's doing across the state, where in the state we're seeing it. I'll briefly go through the research we've conducted to date that confirms what this is as far as the causal agent. Uh, why is it developed in the last 10 years when it's been in the state for the last 60? Uh, and, and elaborate a little bit there on what the research is saying and how it's directing us and moving forward with our management steps. We'll talk about the currently best management practices for preventing the, the disease, slowing the spread once it's entered into a community and we're dealing with it, and then how to source a lethal viral necrosis resistant variety, a variety that will not die from this, that can survive in the presence of the virus in our affected communities. So uh, we'll go through some of the installation questions as well. Hopefully we'll have time for additional questions where I can elaborate on the specifics that you might have um, uh, and need additional information for. So to start with, in basic terms, you know, viruses are something that we're all familiar with, that we've dealt with from a global pandemic down to the sniffles of our kids coming home from school. And viruses are specific uh, pathogens that cause disease in humans, animals, and you know what, they affect plants too. So when plants get viruses, uh, we see a wide range of symptoms, just like we do in humans that are that are affected by a particular virus, different plants will have different symptoms to the same virus. And so they uh, can cause differing diseases in different people and different, different grass varieties. Uh, we'll talk more about that and how it relates to sugarcane mosaic virus, the virus we're talking about today, and the two diseases that it causes on Floritam and the other varieties of St. Augustine grass that we have in the state. Viruses in general are difficult to control. We don't have any antibiotics for us to treat viruses in humans. Uh, same thing applies for turf grass. Our fungicides do not apply uh, control, um, are not control mechanisms that we can use for viral disease. We are working on some more uh, next generation type of, of um, management options. But for right now, we have very limited um, steps that we can take as far as management once it's been confirmed 
we can allow the disease to play out, we can change the host, and those are, are sort of our options that we're limited to at this point. We'll elaborate on those as we go through the presentation. So is this a new virus? No, the pre-test questions uh, were directed at, uh, is this uh, one virus causing two diseases? That's correct, it is. And the virus we're talking about today is sugarcane mosaic virus. It has sugarcane in the name because that's where it was first found. But even back in the 1960s, this virus was known to infect St. Augustine grass in rural Palm Beach County when St. Augustine grass was used primarily as a forage for animals. There was documentation of yellow leaf blades, mosaic disease, before they truly understood what viruses were involved, this was documented. Later tests confirmed that that mosaic disease from way back then was in fact mosaic caused by sugarcane mosaic virus. Now it didn't cause as much of an issue in the state of Florida as far as turf grass is concerned because it didn't kill lawns. In fact, it didn't even cause symptoms that were really noticeable by the average homeowner. Plant pathologists recognized it was present. We see it from time to time rear up in sugarcane varieties and, and in those crops the, the virus can impact yield, can re require us to change genotypes of the, of the specific sugarcane we're growing. In turf, however, it lay practically dormant with no de development until 2013, when we had reports of several lawns within communities of St. Petersburg, Florida and Pinellas County that were, instead of maintaining a mosaic, developing further symptoms that included death of the lawn, thinning, necrosis, symptoms that had not previously been reported in the last 60 years on St. Augustine grass caused by sugarcane mosaic virus. So something new occurred in 2013. Why it occurred in 2013 and what caused that, we'll go into a little bit as far as what the research is suggesting, suggesting is the case, um, but, but truthfully, we don't exactly know 100% where this came from or why it, it decided to develop a flavor a, a particular craving for Floritam, our most popular variety of St. Augustine grass in the state of Florida. Dr. Gaziz, as mentioned, was going, is going to talk more about symptoms and recognizing what those symptoms are. But if in the context of understanding what these two things are, mosaic is the pattern that you're seeing on the screen now of yellowing, that's a broken yellow lines along leaf blades of St. Augustine grass. This symptom is indicative of mosaic and is the extent of what we see caused by sugarcane mosaic virus on other varieties of St. Augustine grass besides Floritam. This is pretty minor. It's difficult to find within an affected lawn of something other than Floritam. You have to crawl around your hands and knees really to locate it. It doesn't develop beyond this into the next topic that I'm gonna talk about, into the necrosis, into the death of lawns. This is a lawn that has mosaic. It has sugarcane mosaic virus all through it. The homeowner in Pinellas County whose lawn this was, was thrilled that this lawn looked as good as it did. And really the yellowing was not noticeable from a distance or even when you're walking across the lawn. So this is a virus that's been here. This is what it's done for the last 60 years and not cause us any headaches within the last 10 years. The next step, the evolution of this has developed from mosaic into something new that we're calling lethal viral necrosis. Lethal because the, it kills the turf and it had never done that before. Viral because it is caused by that same virus, sugarcane mosaic virus. And necrosis is that browning that we see that first occurs in the fall or winter time of the year in the same patterns that we saw from the mosaic symptom. So the yellowing transitions in the variety Floritam, the browning and necrosis and death and thinning of the turf, which is really what impacts the aesthetic of our lawn, which makes this a headache for us, which makes us uh, need to do something about this problem. And that includes replacing the grass, which costs us lots of money, as Henry had talked about. So lethal viral necrosis is a further development, a new disease that's come along, also caused by sugarcane mosaic virus, but that's a different thing uh, than mosaic. So uh, a good way to think about this, an analogy, so to speak, would be with uh, chicken pox. Chicken pox oh, used to be before uh, vaccines, were experienced by lots of kids. They were usually not life-threatening. Um, and it was caused by, the, by the, the same virus that later in life could cause shingles. Shingles was a disease that was caused by that same virus, the chickenpox virus, the varicella. Um, but it occurred in older folks. It occurred at, and caused very different symptoms. LVN is the life-threatening shingles equivalent in turf grass. Chickenpox is the mosaic that we get, we get over, we can live with as kids. So um, 
same virus, two different diseases. Turf grass has the same situation here. The one of concern is lethal viral necrosis, where as you see in this picture, that yellowing begins to die. The turf doesn't grow out of it like it does in mosaic. It thins, it continues to die, and it results in lawns like Henry and John just showed that are thin, invaded by weeds, and not up to the aesthetic that's expected for a Florida lawn uh, for the communities that are affected. So this is a lawn that um, we don't wanna see. This is invaded with weeds. And what the concern really is, is that this can't be stopped with fungicides. This occurs in the Floratam uh, grasses. So to summarize, mosaic lethal viral necrosis are different, two different things uh, caused by the same virus. Mosaic occurs in all varieties of St. Augustine grass. Floratam develops mosaic, citra blue develops mosaic, um, palmetto develops mosaic. Only in the variety Floratam does that mosaic transition and continue to develop into the new problem, lethal viral necrosis, that kills the grass. Other varieties do not, make, do not develop lethal viral necrosis. They stay with a mild mosaic, which comes and goes throughout the year. Uh, but does not cause us concerns or headaches as far as the homeowner is concerned. Provista is a new variety released by Scotts, which is Floratan that's been genetically modified. It can also develop lethal viral necrosis under certain circumstances. It's not recommended to be re replacing Floratan with Provista where this occurs. This is something that Scotts is continuing to research. And I'd recommend if you have specific questions about Provista, reach out to Scotts uh, to provide that information. There are many different genetic lines and new varieties coming along of Provista, the one that I've received samples of that have LVN was the first one to be released. So Floritam is the variety that uh, gets the LVN. Both LVN and mosaic are caused by sugarcane mosaic virus. And uh, it's important to note here that this is a virus that's been around a long time. It's, it's sporadically distributed through the counties that I'm going to talk about. It's not in every community of these counties that are shaded green on my map. And it's not killing every lawn within the state of Florida. It's like any disease, sporadically distributed. Not every lawn reacts exactly the same way. We'll talk about the patterns of dispersal and the, the different patterns of symptom development. They don't all follow the exact same uh, timeline. So uh, we'll talk about what those are as we move through. Keep in mind, this is a disease. It's not every lawn in Florida. It's scattered throughout the counties that we'll talk about. And it's continuing to spread uh, throughout the state but that uh, we continue to monitor. Uh, Dr. Gazis is gonna talk about uh, being able to identify this. I wanted to briefly mention that it's pretty, it's pretty characteristic to see this browning at this time of year when lethal viral necrosis occurs. Communities that have had the problem confirmed can probably have professionals, uh, turf professionals come in and recognize this symptom and not need to send a, a sample to a lab for confirmation. If it's the first, sample on a street in a community, certainly in a new county. We like to have confirmation either through a sample sent to the Gainesville lab, as mentioned earlier, or to Dr. Gazisa's lab in uh, at Trek in, in Homestead. So the only thing that really has come around that looks very similar to lethal viral necrosis is leaf rust. Uh, here's a picture of leaf rust. This affects all varieties of, of St. Augustine grass, including citra blue. Uh, it can look very similar to Lethal viral necrosis, this is rust on the left. This is lethal viral necrosis on the right. Uh, Dr. Gazis is gonna talk more about this. This is rust, lethal viral necrosis. If you look at it with a hand lens, the difference is gonna be in the blister-like pustules of rust. That's one of the key differences that we see. This is really the only other disease that looks similar to this that we're seeing come into the clinic as far as confusion. There are many different causes of, of turf disease that can result in dead turf, however. So just because the lawn is dying doesn't mean it's lethal viral necrosis. In fact, some lawns that have uh, the sugarcane mosaic virus can die from other problems like take all root rot, fungal disease, et cetera. So uh, there's a detection, a diagnosis, and then there's uh, symptoms that develop. These things need to be kept straight. Dr. Gazis is gonna straighten us out on those and talk about what the symptoms are, how to collect a sample and how to confirm whether you have mosaic, lethal viral necrosis, and, and the detection of the virus that causes both of those sugarcane mosaic virus. Where is this problem occurring currently in the state of Florida? Initially, uh, St. Petersburg, Florida is where we found the initial problem to be affecting hundreds of lawns. In 2013 and 14, it was confirmed. 
Uh, it has spread fairly slowly out of Pinellas County. Uh, it has, within the last year, spread over into Hillsborough County, the neighboring county that Tampa is in. Uh, but on the east coast of the state, Palm Beach County has sort of been ground zero as far as uh, uh, real severe problems uh, in communities and spreading out from that county. Palm Beach um, was first detected positive in 2014. Uh, after that, in the last 10 years, that, that disease, that virus has been confirmed all the way up through Vero Beach, down through the Keys. It has uh, rounded the, the tip of Florida into Collier and now Lee County and, and Fort Myers. So um, it has spread fairly quickly for a disease, uh, but also not as quickly as it could have as far as it taking 10 years for it to move county to county and community to community. Within these counties that are affected, as I mentioned earlier, it's not every community that is uh, that is going to have dying turf, dying Floritam. Sometimes we'll have communities right next to each other that will take years for it to move from one to the next, uh, et cetera. So um, it's a little bit unpredictable because it's a disease, it's biology. The most recent developments include 2022 and this year from St. John's County. We've made a leap up from Vero Beach, <clears throat> excuse me, into uh, St. John's where Ponte Vedra is and, and Jacksonville. And, uh, and just this past year, as I mentioned, Hillsboro and uh, potentially Pasco County samples are being processed right now. So it continues to, to crawl from county to county on the west and the east coasts of Florida, uh, moving into communities at each point in the time when that happens, the community then recognizes it, their turf professionals send samples, and we recommend folks work with their county faculty, their county agents to develop a plan, to educate, and to deal with this, um, this problem as it occurs. So here is a, a map, um, uh, and again, Pinellas is where this started, Palm Beach the next year, uh, from Pinellas, we've seen slow movement into Hillsboro and now up into potentially Pasco County. Here we have uh, Palm Beach. It's moved up through Vero Beach and Indian River County, down through Monroe into the Keys, and we've seen it up into Fort Myers. It's likely that it'll continue to progress and move. Um, it's likely also that in these counties that are white, but right next to counties that have been affected for a long time, it's there and we just haven't found it yet. The communities that are affected by this most severely are those that maintain a, a, a very high-end, uh, high aesthetic Floritan monoculture of lawns. Floritan is the susceptible variety where we have the nicest looking lawns, unfortunately, is where this hits the hardest and ends up killing those, those lawns. So I'm talking about a viral disease of turf grass. It's new. How do we know what it is? How do we know that's a viral disease and what causes it and what doesn't and how it spreads? Uh, is the next question. That's a question that we've been addressing through research. Research takes time, it's slow, it's expensive. Uh, I'm going to briefly summarize in the next few slides what we've done so far to answer some of those questions that this problem is caused by sugarcane mosaic virus and hasn't gone away and the management practices that we have have come from the research that we've done uh, throughout the years. So first I'll talk about a viral metagenome of a systemic necrosis and death of lethal viral necrosis. A viral metagenome is a research technique for taking sick plants that we suspect have a virus, pulling out all the virus sequences out and identifying them. Then you take those sequences and those identifications of the viruses, reintroduce viruses back into the, the plants that were sick, healthy versions of the plants that were sick and look for the same symptoms to occur. We've done this, uh, uh, throughout the last 10 years from samples from Pinellas, Palm Beach, and, and others. And it starts with uh, this viral metagenome process. And so in the initial steps, we collected 89 samples of, of turf grass from different communities showing the same symptom. We extracted double-stranded RNA. Our viruses tend to be RNA related. And we sent those in for this next generation viral metagenomic sequencing. The sequences then are compared to known sequences of viruses and other organisms. And we used Illumina to do that. It's a, it's a, a, a technology that we use for identifying DNA and RNA of pathogens. Sequences of two viruses in these initial 89 samples were, were collected. Sugarcane mosaic virus was consistent throughout the 89 samples that had mosaic or lethal viral necrosis. And then we found a new virus that had not been described yet uh, that we later went through validation steps to show the second virus is not involved. It was out there, it was present. Uh, it does not cause mosaic or lethal viral necrosis and is not required for those symptoms to develop. So that was a little bit of a hiccup for us. It took us some time 
to uh, rule that out as a potential cause and to firm up our research methods to know that when we do research like inoculations of varieties, new varieties that we're testing, that we're inoculating it with what is required for it to potentially develop lethal viral necrosis. And uh, that's important because we have to know when we're looking at these new varieties, are they going to die? What is the symptom going to be? Um, can we recommend them for replacing uh, lawns? So here is um, a paper that came out of this early work documenting this new lethal viral necrosis symptom that had occurred. Ricardo was the um, postdoc and PhD student at the time who did a lot of this work. This is uh, basically a viral metagenome. We're going to go through the individual steps, but we extract the nucleic acids. We blast them, which is compare them to known sequences. And what we found was that through this process, we confirmed the viruses present were the sugarcane mosaic virus uh, in these samples that displayed both mosaic and lethal viral necrosis. So the new problem, lethal viral necrosis that developed was caused by an old faux sugarcane mosaic virus. The next question becomes why? And to, do, to answer that question, we looked at strains of the virus, different uh, strains of the virus can cause different levels of severity. Here is some of Ricardo's work looking at SCMV, looking at different locations, Bell Glade, West Palm Beach, St. Petersburg, and comparing the sequence of those viruses, the strains, the types of viruses that we, that we isolated, the known sugarcane mosaic virus sa uh, samples and viruses from around the world. And what we found was that we had some, some differences between the different viruses that we found, but our turf grass viruses causing lethal viral necrosis in the sugarcane mosaic group, grouped with isolates from corn, not with isolates of sugarcane, which is a crop, of course, grown in South Florida alongside uh, St. Augustine grass sod and uh, communities. So this appears to be a corn isolate or variety of sugarcane mosaic virus that has jumped into St. Augustine grass. We've shown that, and then that, asks, that poses additional questions for us as far as uh, where did it come from? Why did it develop this new trick of killing Floritan St. Augustine grass in 2013, et cetera? And we're continuing to do this research and collecting viral samples, sequencing the viruses that are present, looking for the strains, the types of virus that are causing the symptoms across the state, trying to understand how it moves, where it came from, and what we can do about it as far as host resistance and recommending varieties that are not going to die like the Florethan variety does. So because we had the second virus present, it's called Bermuda grass latent virus. In the initial samples, we had to run additional samples. This is Dr. Ward of Bukhari. She ran these samples with a different technology called Nanion technology. We looked at over half a million individual RNA reads from samples that we collected, a smaller number of samples this time, even up over a million reads for samples with mosaic, samples with lethal viral necrosis. And we looked for the second virus, Bermuda grass latent virus. It was present in none of the samples that we collected, none of the samples that we processed, those that had mosaic, lethal viral necrosis, and healthy. So this is not a contributor to the lethal viral necrosis problem, sugarcane mosaic virus is the main issue here. When we look at samples that have the lethal viral necrosis symptom and compare with those that have mosaic, we can sometimes see different strains of the virus present. The one that causes lethal viral necrosis is most closely related to a strain that was originally isolated from corn in the state of Ohio. Those that are causing mosaic align more frequently to other strains, including strains from Argentina, from Kenya, uh, from corn and sugarcane alike. So with this second round of data that was finished uh, two years ago, we have now um, initiated a third round of sampling of sequence comparison to try to determine if there are multiple strains. Can we identify the strains that are most damaging? Are there some strains that we could live with and maintain Floritam lawns in their presence? The answer is probably yes. We're a few years away from knowing what those are in developing diagnostic tools to be able to differentiate them at this point. When we look at uh, uh, these samples, the other thing that we have to look for is to make sure that when we find sugarcane mosaic virus, we're finding the whole virus sequence. And this slide just is to illustrate that this JX 
isolate of sugar cane mosaic virus that came from Ohio is represented the entire genome in these samples that we collected and that we processed. So sugar cane mosaic virus is definitely the cause of mosaic and lethal viral necrosis. Those that are most destructive include those that are related to this JX sugarcane isolate from Ohio. It came from corn. There are others, as I mentioned, from other states and countries that uh, our strains are also similar to, particularly those that have been found in the mosaic so far. Uh, and so we're looking further at this to try to determine, uh, is that the case? Uh, what are in a larger number of samples, some of that differentiation that's occurring? This is Dr. Wang in the agronomy department. She is processing many, many samples that have come in to the plant diagnostic center. She is amplifying and sequencing the coat protein sequence of the virus. It's generally pretty uh, well conserved, but it shows differences that we can use to compare the, the uh, viral strains from different parts of the state. Her initial results mirror sort of what we saw from Ricardo's and Warda's in that we have good agreement between Palm Beach, Collier, uh, Pinellas, et cetera. Uh, generally, these sequ sequences, these strains are going to be somewhere between 80 and 95% and similar to each other, so they're very closely related. There are a few samples that have a 74% agreement as far as the sequence of the coat protein. This may be an, a second virus within the podivirus group, maybe a different strain of sugarcane mosaic virus, something that we're continuing to look at and to investigate whether this is also a concern, uh, and what is the total variation of these viruses. It's important for us to know this because we need to know what's out there so that we can challenge our new varieties to a wide spectrum of what they're likely to encounter in the field and know what that, um, what that response of our new variety is going to be to all of the different potential viruses that we'll encounter before we release it, before we recommend it, for communities to go out and expend all this money to plant it, only later to, to potentially find out um, it doesn't die for our current strain, but may die from other strains that are out there. So this is a, a, a research project that's ongoing that uh, to better understand the viral sequences, the viral community population that's out there, how it's changing, and, uh, and where it came from. Most important for us, of course, is to know uh, what we can use to prevent lawns from dying? Can we continue to recommend citrus blue palmetto? And are there others, potentially better varieties that we can recommend? Shifting gears a little bit, in addition to understanding the virus, we want to and, and are continuing to try to understand how we can prevent spread of this virus within communities. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of good news here. We have and know that, that mowers can spread this disease. This is work that I did in the greenhouse looking at St. Augustine grass Florethan that has the sugarcane mosaic virus in it, using an electric mower on a rail system here to mow that infected turf. And then the second tray in the little slide area here is healthy. We mow the diseased, we go over the healthy, and we look to see if we get transmission from one lawn to the next, from one tray to the next. And the results of this research were essentially that this virus does not spread particularly easily on grass, even with a mower. And this research was done with this electric mower. It didn't drive directly over the grass. When we did this, we didn't actually see any transmission from the blade alone. It requires moist conditions, wet turf to begin with, and a tire to grind that moist plant sap into the healthy turf. So it takes the blade to disrupt the grass, takes the wheel to grind it in. And, uh, and in the end, the actual efficiency of these mowers in transmitting the virus is, is not great. Uh, the other information that we found from that is that because of this, because it doesn't transfer particularly easily, we have several options for sanitizing equipment between communities, between lawns that will help us in addition to uh, spraying a sanitizer on the lawn or on the, the mower. Uh, we have other options that we'll talk about as far as allowing the plant sap to dry um, and uh, using equipment uh, in affected areas and not transferring that equipment while that sap is wet into healthy areas. So we'll talk about specifics and what that research has revealed uh, as we move further on. Another area that we've looked at is host genetics. With viruses across the board, when you're dealing with, with crop plants, when you're dealing with um, to a certain extent animal diseases and livestock, the host genetics that you're using in the crop that you're growing can be changed and that's generally how we deal with viral problems. 
in St. Augustine grass, we have one variety that dominates the landscape in Florida. That's Floritam. Floritam is a good variety. It's been around for the last 60 or so years. Uh, it has uh, many good attributes to it, and it's still used across the state in communities that are not affected by LVM. In our research, what we have done is to try to replicate what's happened with Floritam in the lab, in the greenhouse. And to do that, we take the virus, your chemo virus, out of the Floritam. We put it in corn. This is a corn plant. The leaves have that yellow streaking. It's a much bigger plant, so we can get a lot of virus uh, in it. We can extract that virus and then inoculate different varieties of St. Augustine grass in the greenhouse. So here are a bunch of commercially available varieties that we used our corn inoculum to inoculate, waited about two weeks. We saw mosaic symptoms develop in all of them, including Floritam that was collected from different uh, sod farms around the state. We tested those samples first. None of the, the samples had SCMV to begin with, and we have never found SCMV on a sod farm uh, to date. So we, while we have the potential for virus to be spread in sod products, we haven't found that to be the case uh, we haven't found it to be a problem on any sod farm uh, to date. So um, we get the healthy sod from the farm, just like you would in installing in your yard. We then inoculate it by moistening the, the plant surface, grinding corn that has the virus into that canopy in the, in the tray, and then testing it in, in the greenhouse. And what we found initially was that it turned yellow, got mosaic, but it never developed lethal viral necrosis. What we had to do was take the pots of grass, or the trays of grass, move them into a cool temperature incubator, an incubator that dropped the temperature to about 65 degrees Fahrenheit for more than three days. And uh, there are uh, other temperatures and other stressors that can also make lethal viral necrosis occur that we're still researching. 65 Fahrenheit for three days will cause Floritam to go from mosaic to lethal viral necrosis. So you're seeing that here where we have varieties that are not Floritam, that continue to show mosaic in the cool temperatures. Floritam, on the other hand, goes from yellowing to the necrosis and it kills the turf. Uh, so this um, is a temperature trigger. It's something that's been seen with sugarcane mosaic virus in corn uh, before, and our isolate is related to corn isolates. Uh, so it's not entirely new for this, uh, a new trick for this virus to have developed. Um, it is one that uh, is unique to turf or was back in 2013 when we discovered it. So we know that we have a cold temperature trigger. That means that we see this problem most predominantly in the fall and the winter time period. Right now is when we're getting a lot of samples from South Florida all the way up to Central Florida because that cold, cool evening temperature periods have transitioned the mosaic, the floritam that's recovered into lethal viral necrosis, starting the cycle over, causing the lawns to die and to, and to look terrible. So here's the same symptom that we see in the field, replicated in the incubator, this shows us that we have a good inoculation technique. We have good environmental conditions that can result in the same symptom, lethal viral necrosis, in the turf plants that are susceptible. We tested then the turf plants that were available at the time. This is back in 2015. We had Floritam from three different sod farms. Two of them, when they were introduced into cool temperatures after inoculation, died. One of them didn't. That was a really kind of a head scratcher that I'll talk a little more about. We looked at bitter blue, captiva, palmetto. This is before citra blue was. We had a sample we collected from Pinellas that had mosaic only that was collected in the summertime that we grew in the greenhouse and then introduced into the cool temperatures, and it also died. It was Floritam. So we know and, and initially discovered that all of the other varieties we could test, and all that we tested so far besides um, uh, Provista, which we haven't tested but have seen LVN on. Uh, these other varieties only develop mosaic and don't die. And that's one of the first recommendations we came out with. If your lawn dies and you have to replace it, don't replace it with Floritam again. But what about this farm C? We saw one Floritam farm that didn't die. Why not? Well, it answered, it, it posed a, a real can of worms as far as trying to understand why that was the case. And the end answer came from Dr. Kenworth, our turfgrass breeder, program. And when we took those three Floritam accessions, those three samples of Floritam, the one that didn't die, as it turns out, was not Floritam. So it was something that the sod grower thought was Floritam. It was growing. It looked similar. It was harvested. We inoculated it. When he did the genotyping, the genetic genotyping of that grass, it was not Floritam variety. 
And this problem with the difference between a variety and a genotype has reared its head again later as we made recommendations for choosing varieties other than Floratam, because in addition to some of the Floratam not actually being genetically Floratam in the sod product that we were looking at, we found in other cases, the bitter blue sod products that were marketed and sold as bitter blue turned out to be Floratam, marketed under a different name. When that was the case, of course, the Floratam sod died and it's caused us some headache uh, as far as uh, recommendations and knowing that what we purchase will be able to survive and persist in our landscapes where lethal viral necrosis was, is present. This led us to uh, additional sampling, samples collected from 2020 from Boynton Beach area, Duncia Lakes and Isles are two communities that worked with us on this. We collected 47 samples total. We selected individual stolons or stems of turf grass and genotyped them. Costs a lot of money to do this. And Dr. Kenworthy came up with and we got from grants um, to, to know from these lawns that were supposed to have been bitter blue, but that were dying. Was it actually bitter blue? Was it actually Palmetto, what was, the, what was the grass that we were seeing there? Um, not knowing at the time that there was a large problem with some sod products, particularly bitter blue, being marketed as bitter blue, but that again, contained Floratam in the actual product itself. When we looked at nine of those stems of turf grass that had LVN, they all had sugarcane mosaic virus in them, and they were all Floratam variety. We looked at 14 that were mosaic, either growing in as a mixture, some of these sod products, or in lawns that were citra blue, palmetto, or others. And they, if they only had mosaic, they were, after that cold temperature exposure, they were not Floritan. They were some other variety. The samples came from lawns that had been reported, sold as bitter blue, citra blue, palmetto, and unknown. We found a lot of Floritan in the bitter blue lawns, no Floritan in citra blue or pal palmetto, uh, sod that had been purchased. Some of them were unknown as well. Um, bottom line was that from this sampling, we learned that if it had LVN, it was Floratam, nine of the samples genotyped, confirmed, and those that had mosaic were not Floratam. There was no Floratam that was resistant to LVN. There was no other variety showing LVN symptoms, even though that's what it had been marketed as. So Palmetto, Citra Blue, and Raleigh were all uh, tested and found uh, the only developed mosaic. Dr. Gazis is gonna talk about the ways that we diagnose and detect this virus. Um, I'm not gonna talk at length about this. She'll go into some detail about what we do in the lab. Uh, we have PCR, we have ELISA, we have lateral flow tests uh, that can be used to detect that virus. The detection of the virus is coupled with what symptoms are present on that particular grass. The symptom tied to the virus equals a diagnosis. Dr. Gazis is gonna talk in depth about that, what symptoms are caused by mosaic, what symptoms are caused by LVN, and what we do in the clinic is largely detection of the virus. We can tell you what symptoms the piece of grass that you sent in has, knowing what the symptom is across the lawn dictates the diagnosis, whether the lawn has LVN or mosaic. So it's a little bit tricky. She'll go into more detail there about how that works. Uh, I hope that she'll also talk about the immunostrip test, lateral flow. They're very quick. They're easy. They don't work. Unfortunately for this virus, they don't work. She's going to go into more detail about uh, why that is. We can't use them in the field um, like we would like to because uh, even with this sample, it's very much positive. Tests highly positive with ELISA and PCR. We get only the one band showing that this test is working, but it's not detecting SCMV when it is clearly present. As far as costs, we were charging $20 a piece for these samples. We turns out we're losing quite a bit of money in doing that. So we had to up the price to 40 to cover most of our costs there for these ELISA tests. We can run PCR to confirm uh, PCR uh, with the reverse transcriptase required to detect viruses. Costs about $120 per sample. So we don't use it because we don't need it. There's, there's good agreement between ELISA and PCR. Um, again, we don't use the lateral flow tests because they have not been uh, reliable. Um, the ELISA does require more time, but it costs less for its reagents and it's 100% agreement. That's why we are uh, continuing to use it. So what are we continuing to do? We've learned a lot about this virus, the different strains that are present in the state of Florida. Um, we've also submitted what's called a CDIT proposal. This is a proposal 
um, that has a, a large potential for great impact, but is also risky and it is cutting edge technology and not guaranteed to work. It was funded, it was to develop spray induced gene silencing. This would be a, uh, a process that we will be able to confirm whether or not we can spray a RNA segment on to Floratam and prevent that Floratam from developing lethal viral necrosis using gene silencing, RNA interruption. So this is a very high tech, it's very high risk. It is very early in its stages of development. Uh, we have some initial results that suggest that it has the potential to work. We're able to reduce the PDS gene. It's a gene that uh, uh, produces chlorophyll within Floratam. We're able to deliver an RNA target into the grass and show that it can limit the expression of that gene. Now, if we can deliver the viral sequence into there with a sprayable technology, we could potentially prevent the LVN. Again, long way off, something that we're continuing to look at, leaving no stone unturned for potential solutions that would include keeping Floratam, when in reality, what we're recommending currently is to change from Floratam to a different variety. There's a lot of folks on this uh, grant, including Henry and, and uh, John. Uh, we appreciate all the support that we've received from your from the clientele, from county faculty, and in, in, uh, getting letters and, and giving this one a go. Here's uh, some of the work and some of the schedule, 2023 and 24. If this is uh, successful, we'll have proof of concept, and then we can start to develop uh, potentially a, uh, a technology that would still then have to be commercialized, even if it works. Um, to, again, spray and, and then prevent LVN and Floratam. And that will take an additional at least three to five years uh, out from 2024. So this Brahm up in the corner, he's the one doing most of this uh, work. In addition to that, as I mentioned, we are uh, and are receiving monies to establish St. Augustine grass genotype screens for SCMV susceptibility. We want more options that are reliable. Uh, besides just citra blue and palmetto, uh, we're screening additional genotypes from outside the state from different breeding programs. Uh, we've written a, a plant breeding endowment proposal and a larger AFRI proposal uh, to do that. AFRI includes other things and in, in other objectives, but the development of a screen and applying that screen to some of Dr. Kenworthy's genotypes is one of the main objectives there. So we're continuing to search for money, use that money as best we can to come up with uh, solutions for this. Um, that include additional selections for varieties, additional ways to potentially prevent it on Floratam. We're going to switch gears now and talk about uh, what do we do about it and what do we know about the practical movement of this virus, the spread of LVN, and the prevention of moving it into communities, et cetera. The rate of the, the spread of LVN has varied quite a bit, depending on whether you're talking about from a lawn-to-lawn -lawn movement, community-to-community -community movement, county to county movement, et cetera. The scales as far as county to county uh, have been relatively slow. It's taken 10 years and it hasn't spread through the, the state like wildfire. It's moved fairly slowly, methodically out from the Pinellas and, and Palm Beach County initial detections. Within communities, it's also been um, erratic. Sometimes it moves quickly from one community to the next that are adjacent. And other times you'll have a community that waits four or five years after their neighboring community is affected. And, uh, and, and still has, has some time before lethal viral necrosis shows up. Why is that? We don't know for sure exactly why. It varies from community to community, uh, but it does. When we talk about lawn to lawn spread, the spread is a little more predictable. The virus unfortunately moves out ahead of symptoms, meaning that if your lawn is tested positive because it's symptomatic, chances are two to three of your neighbor's lawns on either side are already positive. That has been a major limitation for us as far as being able to prevent further spread with our mowers because we don't know yet that those lawns are infected. There's very small amounts of disease that are largely undetectable by eye that can occur during the two to three years that it becomes more severe in the initial lawn before it's detected and then confirmed um, by a test. So the typical progression has been first year, small patches of bronzing grass could look like Pets have used the, the lawn, uh, uh, gone to the bathroom on it. Could be that there's fungal disease, could be a lot of different reasons for a small bronzing patch of grass. Year two, that patch expands and comes back in the, in the fall of the year. Weeds start to invade. And by lawn three, the typical progression involves that patch and several others having developed. They start to coalesce. And by year five, we see 
wide scale turf loss within a floor at Tamlon due to the sugarcane mosaic virus and LVN that reoccurs again in the fall of the year. During the summertime, the floor tan that survived will start to recover. Weeds will come in as well. Any of the grasses like palmetto or citra blue that are present in a mixture of floor tan and others will recover and will start to grow and overtake the floor tan, leading a, a unruly sort of patchwork of weeds and different varieties of grass uh, present in the affected lawns. Meanwhile, while this is occurring in the initial lawn, lawns stretching out from the left and the right of the affected lawn are becoming infected through mower transmission and additional lawns and communities can become aff affected infected by the virus being spread by aphids, an insect pest that flies and it can move this and jump it from community to community. So the, the rate of spread does in, indeed vary. This is not what happens in every case. It's what we've seen to be the most common as far as the progression that I've described. The lawns that are most severely affected are the highest quality monocultures of Floritam as mentioned. Um, other stresses besides that low temperature can increase the severity or how quickly that, that lawn moves through its progression of first finding it, the killing large sections. Um, and it depends on what other stresses might be present. So fungal disease can contribute to a, a more rapid decline. Um, and we can have herbicide stress and others that can contribute to LVN becoming more severe more quickly. What is going to happen in my community is a question we get a lot of whenever it's introduced. Folks detect it. They know it's there. Um, you know, it's different for every community. So predicting what's going to happen is tough, uh, particularly whenever you're predicting about the future, right? Management. What we can do as far as management is understand how these viruses work, how this virus works, and how it's spread. And the virus can only multiply and survive inside disease plants. The nice thing about this virus is that it does not survive long outside of the plant. If sap on a mower dries, the plant virus dies. So it's spread only in that moist plant sap. It has to, while the equipment is wet, be introduced to a healthy lawn, be ground into with a tire or footprints, that healthy lawn, and that's when it can get inside the plant and cause a new infection. Because it doesn't survive long outside the plant, uh, or in dead plants or dried plant parts. It has uh, uh, given us options for sanitizing mowers, preventing spread on mowers uh, that I'll talk about in just a moment beyond having to use chemical sanitizers in every case. It doesn't affect the palms, ornamental plants, uh, pets, people, or wildlife. Only some grasses for them being most severely uh, affected. So that's good. We don't have to worry about a threat to our, to our uh, families or our pets or anything like that. Um, and so, um, you know, to put it in perspective, this is a lawn grass. It's one that um, only affects our, our lawns. Moist plant sap from normal mowing, whether you're doing it yourself, whether a machine is doing it, a, a robot or a company comes in and mows your entire community is what can spread this. And it's not the mower's fault that this happens. It's a, a product of, of what mowers do, grinding up the old plant material you're trying to, to remove and moving it uh, across lawns. And uh, when that happens, it has the potential to spread it. Um, within a lawn, you know, we try to avoid moving from the diseased areas into healthy to limit the tighter, the amount of virus that's spread. Um, it can help to slow progression a little bit, but uh, realistically, we have not been able in any of our communities to stop the spread at one lawn or two lawns and prevent it, even when we use mowing, sanitizers, and uh, dedicated equipment. So the objective here in the management is to limit spread, slow spread. We have not so far been able to stop spread completely. One, because mowers, um, uh, as Henry mentioned, can't be sanitized between each lawn. It's not logistically possible or economical. Uh, and two, we have the virus spread by aphids as well that can jump across those lines that we create um, and, and introduce this that way. So some of the best things that we can do as far as preventing movement on mowers, allow plenty of time for the sap, the, the turf grass plant sap to dry on the mowing equipment that we're using when we're going between accounts, when we're going from one pod within a community to the next or from one community to another community, particularly again, where we know one community might have the problem and a second might not. We wanna mow the healthy areas or communities first, do the diseased ones last and allow plenty of time for that sap to dry on the equipment when we're moving it from place to place. Uh, 
We can use sanitizers and they're effective at killing viruses. Household bleach is one of the most effective that we have, but it's very corrosive to the metal of the equipment that we use. There are other commercial sanitizers like Vercon S, Green Shield, Pine Sol even has a, a label that includes uh, prevention of spread of viruses on it. These uh, can be used. They have been used in some communities in Palm Beach County where we observed uh, and found that they were not effective at completely preventing spread of this virus. So we can sanitize our mowers. Mowers are not the only way that this is spread. The sanitization between communities tends not to be necessary, again, if we can allow plenty of time for that plant sap to dry. So they can be used. In some cases, they're used out of an abundance of caution. In other cases, uh, they're not necessary and we still see reductions in spread. Is it spread through water, soil, or is it airborne? No, this has to be in a plant. There are some plants like Bermuda grass, crabgrass that can survive in soil beyond glyphosate application, even beyond fumigation in some cases. Uh, and so where we have infected plants that are left behind, whether that's St. Augustine grass or some of these weeds, they can carry the virus forward. The virus can move in from neighbor's lawns uh, back into areas that are resodded. So it's not spread by water, soil, or airborne. Uh, it is spread by infected plants. Aphids are the airborne insect pests that can spread this disease and can uh, carry this virus. And they carry it for corn, for sugarcane, and for St. Augustine grass. Green aphids are not real common on St. Augustine grass, but they are an occasional pest. Um, means that we can't know when they're going to be there enough to be able to use insecticides to prevent them unless we treat year round, which we don't want to do. Uh, and even if we did treat, once they feed for a short period of time, they can transmit the virus, even if that feeding activity ends up killing the aphid, uh, they have already done their damage. So um, other questions that we get, should clippings be removed? There's virus in these clippings that the mower picks up. Should we take them off the lawn? No, once the virus is present, adding back additional virus that's in that material doesn't matter because the virus that's in there will die once that leaf clipping dries out. The turf that it's collected from is already infected, so more virus isn't gonna cause a bigger problem in this case. So leave the clippings from affected lawns, don't move them around, but remove them from equipment between affected and healthy communities where we can and sections of communities. That's where Henry's picture of the leaf blower on the, on the lawn mower comes in. If we can get some of the loose clippings off, in particular where we're gonna be doing a fairly quick turnaround from one community to the next, getting rid of those, allowing them to dry out is some, way, some ways that we can reduce the chances of spread on that uh, equipment. So that's how we can sort of slow spread, um, try to prevent spread. If it's already in our lawn, in our community, LVN has killed my lawn, now what? Now what do we do? The number one thing to keep in mind is not to regrass with Floritan. Not that it isn't a good grass, but it will die if we put Floritan back into a lawn that has succumbed to lethal viral necrosis. So um, we want to avoid doing that at all costs. That sounds easier than it is, because Floritam is pervasive throughout the market. Even though we see Floritam written on a large portion of Floritam, some of the other sod products marketed under different names is also Floritam as far as its genetics. And so it will die as well. It doesn't just have to be called it. If it is Floritam, it will die. Citraboom, Palmetto are two varieties that we recommend. There are others that can work. We recommend these because they don't die from the virus and because they have been consistent in the genetics of the sod products when they're marketed by licensed producers. And what that means is that if we go to a turf pr producers of Florida, TPF sod farm and purchase licensed Citra Blue or Palmetto, Dr. Kenworthy's genetic research has shown we have a very high likelihood of having a genetically pure, a genetically uh, consistent sod product. If we go and purchase from a third party wholesaler, something like shade grass or uh, palmetto that can't be written as palmetto on the sales receipt, then caveat emptor, buyer beware. We've seen many cases where third-party wholesalers get confused, get uh, things mixed up, and end up selling Floritam back to communities that are suffering from lethal viral necrosis. This is a, a, a real problem because now we've wasted the money on the sod that will die and have to be replaced again. And uh, nobody wins in, in that uh, particular situation. So Citraboo and Palmetto are grasses that we can recommend. There are others that, <clears throat> that might work. 
Um, these two have been the most consistent, again, as far as their, their genetics. <clears throat> so what do I do? Don't regrass with Floritan. We'll say it again and probably two more times. But we have to use something different. How do we know if what we have in our purchasing is different than Floritan? There are certified and licensed uh, turf grass producers within the state of Florida. Those terms get misused in a lot of cases, however. The only lawn grass that's certified within the state of Florida by the Southern Seed Certification Association is Citra Blue. This does not guarantee sod product purity, but it guarantees purity at the initial acquisition by that farm of the material that they use to grow the product. So it offers some protection, some assurance. It's not a written guarantee of sod genetic purity when we have a, a certified grass. So it's not the only option that we can consider. Citra blue is a new grass. It's one that has a distinct blue color. It's one that again has been consistent when we say and we know we've bought it from a, a certified or a licensed producer. It has been citra blue genetics. And so that's one of the reasons why it's it's recommended. Palmetto is, uh, is not certified, but there are licensed producers, licensed through Sod Solutions, the company that owns the, the rights to Palmetto. If they have Palmetto on the sales ticket, they are going to be a licensed producer uh, and they're going to likely provide you with what is actually Palmetto. If they won't put it in writing, don't purchase it, in my opinion. As far as the two varieties that we recommend, Citra Blue is new, it's a UF release. It has less data and time in the field, so it's been out for a few, just a few years. And the positive things so far, what we've seen is very much better fungal disease resistance than palmetto. Palmetto is an established variety. It's been around a long time. We know the ins and outs and the pluses and minuses of palmetto. It has fungal disease susceptibility issues, which means it will have to be treated with fungicides for diseases like large patch, gray leaf spot, and take all root rot. Both grasses have good shade tolerance, so they're, they're applicable in areas where we have uh, shady lawns. In fact, Citra Blue does better in the shade because it can develop spongy growth habit in uh, very, very uh, sunny, full sun uh, lawns. That's one of the negatives of the Citra Blue variety is it can get spongy uh, and scalp damage can occur where it grows aggressively. Chinch bugs and sod webworms can get on both palmetto and Citra Blue as well as all of the other varieties of St. Augustine grass grown in the state of Florida, uh, there is some resistance within chinch bug communities uh, and populations within the state. So we have to be careful what products we use, rotate those and steward those products well in our communities to make sure we can maintain efficacy. What do we wanna do? Do not grass with Floratan. What can we use? What about zoysia, bahia, seashore, paspalum, Bermuda grass or ryegrass? Yes, you can use all of those. They have the potential to survive. They won't die from LVN. Boisia grass is not a host. Bahia grass is not a host. Um, Paspalum, Bermuda grass is a host, but it only develops mosaic. Uh, and ryegrass is a cool season grass used as a winter cover. If we've had death of the lawn in the fall, we don't want to put or make a decision on what sod to produce. Ryegrass can be a temporary band-aid, so to speak. Uh, and can make a nice temporary lawn for, for South Florida. These are all options that have pluses and minuses. Zoysia grass is higher maintenance, requires more maintenance costs, can provide a very nice, in fact, superior aesthetic to St. Augustine grass. The hay grass is the opposite. It's lower input, but doesn't have the same aesthetic um, and is maybe not as, as applicable to extreme South Florida as zoysia grass or, or certainly St. Augustine grass. Seashore paspalum is, is a beautiful grass, but takes way too much input for a home lawn, uh, average home lawn in the state of Florida. Expect many different fungicide and other cultural inputs to keep paspalum looking good. It won't die from LVN. It will die from many other fungal diseases. Bermuda grass is underutilized in the state as far as a lawn grass. It's certainly an option to consider. Many times though, our HOAs limit our um, choices and decide what grasses are to be used. We're happy to work with HOAs to try to expand those selections within the aesthetic that they expect uh, using different varieties or different species. Your county extension folks, your turf grass team here at UF can help with additional information there. When we deal with those communities and we work with homeowners on what is the timing of grass replacement or what do we do now that Floritam has entered our community, I get a lot of questions to start with, do we have to? Do we have to replace all the turf at once? Do we have to um, go with one variety or another? Do we have to use plugs or sod versus some other, um, some other 
option? And the short answer is, is no. Sure, strategies are going to vary greatly by the individual or by the HOA. They're going to be tailored by what their tolerance for the aesthetic is for the individual option that they, they pick. Plugs may take three years to grow in. If you can deal with your lawn looking um, subpar for three years while it does that, it might be an option for you. If your HOA, if your aesthetic limitation dictates that you need a, a, a faster solution, sod may be the only answer. Your county faculty, uh, the turf team here at UF can help walk through some of those options and what to expect. In the end, it's the HOA and the individual's choice as to what is done. And I've seen everything as, as John had, uh, had mentioned, wall-to-wall -wall replacement versus piecemeal, lawn-to-lawn -lawn, uh, as required. Uh, it boils down to aesthetics. I will say that no strategy from any community has halted the progression uh, altogether. In other words, once it's introduced, it will spread sometimes slowly, sometimes more quickly. We haven't been able to stop it with the sanitation, with mowers, et cetera. It continues to crawl from lawn to lawn until they're all affected. And those that are predominantly Floritam will suffer the most and will eventually, in many cases, need to be replaced or will continue to look poor for many years to come. Uh, and some, some communities have not done anything. They've allowed it to go, work its course, hoping that it'll go away. Uh, so far, it has not, as far as I know. So there's no remediation effort that uh, also has allowed Floritam to be used. We had one community, one property in particular in the Keys that excavated soil, put up barriers, brought in new soil, brought in Floritam sod that was clean, um, and they got SCMV back within a couple of years, and that lawn failed again, even when, when, when they went to that extreme to try to prevent that virus from moving back in. How it happened or why, we're not exactly sure. Could be aphids, could be that it was uh, weeds that were further down in the soil profile than they were able to excavate. But in the end, once this has come into the community, Floritam's not recommended and hasn't been able to be reliably used as a new lawn. In the renovation steps, we wanna follow the IFAS recommendations for good uh, management practices as far as what to do in a renovation. And that starts generally with a non-selective herbicide. Glyphosate is an active ingredient sold as Roundup and many other products that does a very good job of reducing weed competition, gives us a, a clean slate to install our sod on, increases the chances that sod will be uh, vigorous and healthy through its first year in, in, uh, in the new lawn. Um, it's applied before new sod is placed. So alternatives would include selective herbicides after we install the sod. Unfortunately, those also have residual activity. They can cause stress to our new sod and are a less uh, attractive option. There are glyphosate concerns. Those are addressed in EDIS publication, EP580. Um, uh, for whatever reason, if a community does not want to use glyphosate, there are some alternatives discussed there that are non-selective as well. And there are uh, some selective herbicides used post-install uh, to consider. But glyphosate um, has been a, a good active ingredient for us. Uh, largely, the concerns are not found in science. This publication, EP580, goes through many of those and why I make that statement, why UF makes that statement. After we've used a non-selective herbicide, in general, it's recommended to remove the dead sod, cut it, cut the weeds out that may have not been effective. Uh, affected by the herbicide. And the objective here is to start with a clean slate and a, and a soil that the sod can tack into and establish in, not to eliminate the virus. We can't eliminate the virus. We want to do what we have recommended anyway, as far as removing the old sod. We don't have to do anything extra besides removing that old sod and weeds to give us a new slate for our new sod installation. Uh, provide a good soil bed by um, leveling the area, by doing an irrigation system audit to make sure we have good irrigation application and coverage uh, after the install and, uh, and give the chance, the sod the best chance to survive by following those recommendations. And the virus will persist. If we use something other than Floritam, it won't matter because the virus won't kill our turf. As far as uh, what's most important after site prep is post-install care. And Sod, turf grass in general in the state of Florida is going to require fertilizer. It's going to require water. It's going to require uh, inputs as far as insecticides and occasionally fungicides to manage insect and fungal pests. Weeds uh, should be minimal if we have a healthy sod to, to start with. And if we use that non-selective option at the beginning, 
want to follow our IFAS recommendations here. There's no special tweaking that we need to do if our lawn has failed from LVN when we install new grass. Follow the IFAS recommendations and our EDIS publications, and that'll give us the best chance for uh, a healthy start with our new grass after LVN has failed, including following the mowing height and frequency recommendations for the species or the variety that we choose. Again, here is a Palmetto lawn in Pinellas County. This had failed two years previously. Sod was, uh, was installed, Floritam sod, two years before this. Each of those two years that sod failed had to be replaced by the homeowner at the cost of thousands of dollars. This was the result in spring of a third installation, this time of Palmetto. It didn't die. It did still have mosaic. The virus was present. This healthy lawn was very much manageable as far as the insect and, and fungal pests and was a, a big relief to the homeowner as far as its aesthetics that it was able to provide. Similar results have been shown with Citra Blue. Um, both of these grasses, however, if they don't receive the proper treatment and, and proper care can fail for reasons other than the virus. Virus can be present, the lawn can fail. It's not gonna be caused by the virus if it's something other than Floritam. So we have to take care of it, whether the virus is present or not. When we do that, these grasses give us a fighting chance. Floritam lawns resodded end up looking like this, and this occurs much more quickly the second time around on the new sod. The new sod is stressed, the virus is present, and it equates to a disaster as far as the aesthetic of that lawn after the install of perfectly good Floritam sod. Well, speaking with landscape maintenance folks, pest control operators, the uh, main thing that I stress is to keep the virus out of your accounts and make sure you're not bringing it to communities. And largely what we've seen uh, is that they are not. Our pest control operators are not moving this around. Once the equipment dries, it doesn't uh, move. Once we see influx into a new community, early on, we, I would go to every community. I would look to see where did it come in? Is that where they unloaded the equipment? Did it spread from that point of, of uh, infection outward from where equipment was likely to have first had the virus on it? And the answer was no. It was being introduced in the middle of some of these communities and areas that would make no sense if this was being transferred on uh, equipment mowers or, or line trimmers, et cetera. So uh, we can sanitize between accounts either by removing the clippings and allow them to dry or by using uh, sanit sanitizers, labeled sanitizers on tires, decks, and blades. Either option is available and effective. We can allow it to dry. We can use sanitizers. We don't necessarily have to do both. Mow the infected areas last. If you're dealing with uh, communities that already have the virus, you're having to mow, mow those areas last and educate HOAs and homeowners about what the disease is, how it spreads, what's likely to occur, and call on IFAS for your county faculty or Turfgrass team uh, for help there to educate them and to explain uh, when uh, fingers start to get pointed towards our guys who are mowing lawns. Um, we try to step in and educate and say, you know, it's going to spread whether you're mowing it, they're mowing it, they're following steps. Hopefully, if they're contacting us to help prevent that spread as much as possible, it's not possible to stop it at this point. As far as the pest control operators, the guys who are spraying, uh, we've been recommending that they get it confirmed, get it confirmed in a lab so that we can educate folks on what this virus problem is, where it is, and then start to make changes in what's being done. The number one change is to stop spraying the fungicides, stop with the other maintenance in those particular lawns. They're gonna be wasted as far as the lawn is gonna to continue to, to suffer and die from the viral disease. Even though it has fungal disease as well, if we can treat that, it won't matter in the end point of what's going to happen to that Floritam. Rumor control, a lot of folks, uh, um, uh, get misinformation out there about the spiral disease and what can cause it or how it spreads or what we can do about it. And uh, so contact your county office. You can contact me directly. My, my email and phone number are going to be here at the end uh, for information. Happy to come speak to HOAs in conjunction with your county faculty to educate about what this is and, and how it works. We have not found this on sod farms. We have not found, um, even in cases where the sod rapidly dies after installation, we went in, tested sod at the sod farms to rule out the possibility that it came in with the sod. And so far, every time we've done that, we have not found that it came in on the sod. It can survive in those communities, in those lawns, and kill the lawn more quickly the second and third time around. We haven't found it on sod products. We 
ask sod producers to educate their employees about what it is and what it looks like in case it does come in, establish protocols for decontamination of equipment that comes back to the sod farm. We certainly don't want to, to introduce this from a community into a sod farm by bringing in rip out material um, back to the farm. So dispose of that off farm, consider limiting customer traffic, installer traffic back in, in production areas, certainly. We don't wanna carry this into a sod farm and have that be a problem. And so far I've found that that is not the case. This is my uh, office phone number. This is my email address. I'm gonna stop there, turn it back over to, uh, to Henry. And, uh, and then if there's time for questions, we'll do that or potentially at the end there. Thank you very much for your attention and, and opportunity to come speak today. Thank you very much, Dr. Harmon. Well, my brain is full, that's for sure. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any time for uh, for a break. I mean, maybe maybe uh, this is uh, in person we can have it, but but the next speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Romina Gassis. Uh, she's going to talk about identification of the symptom sampling and diagnosis. Again, she's uh, the director of the Plant and Diagnostic Clinic in Homestead at the Tropical Research and Education Center. And she's also a um, um, faculty of the Plant Pathology Department at the University of Florida. So Dr. Gassis, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you everyone for um, attending this workshop and this webinar. Um, again, my name is Romina Gassiz. I am part of the plant pathology department. I'm based at the Tropical Research and Education Center here in Homestead. Um, and I'm an expert in tropical and subtropical plants, including ornamentals and tropical fruits. Um, but I'm also your local resource for turf uh, plant health uh, issues. So, um, you know, we do a lot of the testing here in-house and we also collaborate with the rest of the faculty, including uh, Dr. Harmon. So today I'm gonna be talking about how to identify the disease, uh, which are the symptoms, how to take a good sample and how to get an accurate diagnosis. So um, this is the, the plant clinic here in Homestead at the, at the REC. Um, and at the beginning, like starting 2018 to 2020, we received a lot of samples uh, of turf uh, with symptoms of little viral necrosis. And as it was mentioned before, we really were expecting this disease kind of to take over, right? And we saw this increase in sample submission, which we can relate to what is happening in the local communities and um, just in the residential areas in South Florida. And what I want you to pay attention is in the proportion of the samples that were positive for the virus and therefore um, had symptoms and we confirmed that they had the disease, which is little viral necrosis, and the proportion of samples that were negative for the disease. So at the beginning, um, you know, we had, um, an increasing number of samples that tested positive for the virus and were confirmed to have the, the, the disease uh, do, uh, based on the symptoms that we see on the sample or in the lawn in the residential areas. However, in the last uh, few years after 2020, uh, we have seen a decline on these samples being positive. That could be many reasons. That could be because the spread has slowed down and again, um, as Phil mentioned, this is an erratic um, dynamics of spread, but could also be because we have been giving a lot of workshops. And I think a lot of the pest control companies and landscaping companies are learning how to identify the symptoms of the disease by themselves. So I want to believe that's the case uh, because then it means that we are doing our job and you guys are able to identify the disease um, in the field and then take those precautions of moving from a community that has the disease to a community that doesn't have a disease. So this is kind of like the objective of this talk to reinforce the one that for the people that already know how to identify that disease and have been experiencing a lot of issues with this disease I'm sure you are masters in identifying this. 
um, but also reinforcing this knowledge and to the people that are new to this disease that haven't heard about it, um, knows how to identify it in the field and what to do if you suspect that a lawn, either from your own lawn or from a client um, suffers from this disease. So um, I'm going to start talking about the symptoms. And as it has been mentioned multiple times, mosaic is a type of symptom that we see in this sugarcane mosaic infected turf. And it is called mosaic because it really resembles when you have those tiles in your house that you kind of have a pattern um, of um, colors on one side and a different colors next to it. So this is kind of why it's called mosaic, right? Because you have those chlorotic sections on, on the otherwise green blade. And in, in it goes really uh, following the veins of the blade. And so you see this streaking of uh, chlorosis and those symptoms we call mosaic. Um, here in, at the right, is another sample, another photo of um, actually in the field, a very good photo sent by a client, um, you know, um, star for that client. It's a very good sample of mosaic. Um, and then that's, you know, um, sometimes I get photos in the mail and then I can provide some help. I still recommend to send a sample for diagnosis for be sure that uh, the the virus is present, but that's a pretty good tell that it is. So the plant develops general uh, chlorosis, which is yellowing, mosaic patterns at the beginning, then it may become uh, more yellowing until it's completely yellow. Uh, you see those yellow streaks along the veins, and depending on the time of infection, there may be some severe stunting of the plant. Um, and Sometimes I don't see this very often, uh, and it may be related to the environment. Uh, you see that purplish tint towards the tip of the blade and towards the edge of the blade. Um, so it's not a symptom that I always see. So I want to say that um, it's not always present, but sometimes we see it. And very important, as it was mentioned before as well, Symptoms are temperature dependent and they will change with time as the disease progresses. So Phil talk about, um, he talked about how mosaic transitions into necrosis when the temperatures go down, right? So that's a trigger, that's a stress that, um, um, in, induces this necrosis, usually on those chlorotic mosaic patches, right? Those are the ones that start to decline and become necrotic. And so again, we are talking about uh, Floratan, right? Phil went really in depth talking about the differences of the cultivars within the Sagangustin group. And we are talking specifically about um, San Agustin cultivar Floratan, where we see this transition from mosaic to necrosis when temperatures go down. So in terms of diagnosis and looking at symptoms, once you cross that threshold that it went into necrosis, you have really a short time until the, the grass and the blades will have that dieback and that decline, and they will completely see like the, the photo that you see at the bottom of the slide. So if you bring me a sample like this, or if you send me a photo like this, there is no way I could even see what is behind <laughs> that dead tissue, right? And so perhaps it was a necrosis caused by LVN and back in time it had mosaic. However, once it crossed that threshold in which the blade and the, um, those pieces of lawn have that um, dieback, then, you know, we cannot observe those characteristic symptoms of the disease. So again, just to reinforce you, um, let's say that the grass gets infected during the summer, and then you will see the symptoms uh, that correspond to mosaic. So you still see some greenery on your lawn, 
And then if you look close to the blades, you will see that uh, chlorosis that resemble mosaic tiles. Now, as the season passes and we start getting colder uh, temperatures, you will see that transition of that infected chlorotam turf become necrotic all the way until it dies back and then you get the death of the lawn, right? And it was mentioned before as well that the timing could be, you know, in recently installed um, lawns could be really fast within a year. And it's because they have an additional stress um, because they are new installations, right? Um, but it could also be three, four years that you have the, the, the death of, of the lawn. But some patches may show death and dieback. Um, and so again, very important to understand that the symptoms will vary depending on the season. Okay, so if it's the summer, the spring, they have new growth, uh, we have a lot of water coming in from rainfall. Um, you know, the, the grasses may even be um, colonized by other non floratum grasses. So from the far, you will see a green grass, right? A green lawn. But if it's a floratum and if it's infected with a sugarcane mosaic virus, it will progress into dieback and, and, and necrosis uh, as the temperature goes down which is uh, pretty, corresponds pretty well with the number of samples that we get in the clinic here in Homestead. Uh, we are very south in the Florida Peninsula, so we enjoy warm weather, but we do have some days during the winter in which the temperature falls below 65, right? Like today and tomorrow, it's gonna be um, upper 50s, low 60s, and we even this year in 2023, we went below 50, uh, close to Christmas. So I remember using my big jacket and being all cold. And it really corresponds to, so for instance, on the 26th, you get this really cold weather. A week or two weeks after, the clinic will receive a lot of samples because you start seeing that necrosis. And this is when people start to worry about um, their lawn dying. And so again, Temper to very important trigger and very uh, correlated to disease symptoms of necrosis. This is a sample submission by month. And again, this is uh, corresponds to the symptoms that we see on the lawn. During the spring and summer, we have less sample submission because people are less worried about how the lawn looks. In terms of you have still some green, uh, even though it may be a little bit yellow, you still see green, you still see growth, you don't see patches if the, if the lawn is healthy otherwise. So if you don't have large patch or take all disease, you may still see good coverage. Um, and again, it may be that those patches that died the year before are covered by weeds or other grass that will invade that lawn, or it was a lawn that to begin with was a mix of San Agustin grasses. So not only the cultivar Floratum, but also other cultivars within that group. So during that period, we don't see many samples, uh, submissions, people are relatively okay. Um, however, once we get low temperatures, we see a lot of concerns, a lot of calls from extension agents, a lot of calls from homeowners calling the clinic, um, asking about what's going on with their lawn. And again, this is because these low temperatures are a stress that triggers the necrosis and brings to the edge this lawn and starts dying back. And you start seeing those um, ugly symptoms in the lawn. So it's very important to learn how to recognize the symptoms early so no more resources are invested and mitigation can be planned. So this is what Phil um, summarized and stressed at the end of his talk, that if you have a lawn that is floratum and it is infected with sugarcane mosaic virus, um, you really have to think about if you wanna put more resources in that lawn. 
right? Because the prognosis is bad uh, so far. And so putting more fertilizers and putting fungicides when the disease is not fungal origin, um, you have to think about it. And maybe it's time to educate your client and start planning for when that lawn is going to be completely bare and an eyesore. Right, so you can prepare your client to um, thinking about the investment of reinstalling a lawn. So it is a good idea to know how to recognize even the mosaic, right? Even during that summer where you still get lawn coverage, it would be a good idea to start planning for when that lawn is gonna collapse. And so I'm gonna start with the field symptoms for um, little viral necrosis. These are two photos, again, sent by a client, perfect photos. Um, and you can see how there is a widespread yellowing and death of the lawn, right? Um, you may see those patches of green, and I will question if those are actually St. Augustine Floridan uh, patches. Again, we see a lot of confusion about what we have and the mix of turf. When, when when lawns are installed, it may be a mix of cultivars. And you will see this generalized yellowing um, and dieback because the virus is systemic. So it travels through the vascular system throughout the lawn that is connected um, either by rhizomes or stolons in the case of St. Augustine. So it moves throughout, right? Like when you have COVID, you have COVID in your um, toe and then you have COVID in your fingers, right? Of your hand. So it moves throughout the body or the plant in this case, uh, because it moves through the vascular system. So that is the reason you get um, generalized dieback and, and yellowing. Another clue that you have, uh, that your lung has LVN is uh, this, kind of um, dispersal spread pattern, right? Again, you this may not be the case for you, um, but there are cases in which, in which we have seen this spread pattern of the mower and the, the wheels, right? That we were talking about how they um, these wheels will homogenize or bre break the blades and the sap will come out. And then if it's moist, that's how you... Uh, move around the virus from lawn to lawn. So that's a good indication that the lawn may have, um, may be infected with the virus and may have the disease. So some of the confusions that you may face when you see symptoms in the field, uh, one of them is gray leaf spot, which if you if you look really closely, you know, it's not that similar. However, these are kind of textbook photos, right? Usually in the field, you have a mix of, of issues. You have some dieback because of um, perhaps bad nutrition or um, deficient irrigation. So you won't be able to isolate one symptom that correspond to one disease, right? Usually when you uh, look at field guides and books, they, they show you textbook photos, <laughs> but that's not the reality, right? The reality is you see a mix of symptoms. And so I put here in the right, uh, the typical symptoms of LVN, and then compare it with the uh, gray leaf spot. In some cases here, for instance, you see some necrosis, which is not LVN, um, but uh, it could be confusing for you. Now the rust uh, disease was already mentioned, uh, it could be confusing because at the beginning, before the postules start erupting and have those rust spores that you can take with your hand. So you will, when you touch it, you will notice the rusty color uh, spores getting attached to your hands. But before that, there's chlorosis. So that symptom may be confusing with um, sugarcane mosaic uh, virus infection and, and LVN mosaic associated. Now in the field, um, this is how LVN, remember LVN, you have, I have here in the top right of your slide, generalized dieback, 
But of course, the dieback doesn't happen one night overnight, right? So you will see the progression of the of the dieback. And so at some point, you may be confused with diseases such as large patch, right? But that's easily um, seen under the microscope. So it can be uh, distinguished quite, quite simply. Another common, common disease is TACO, very common in South Florida, and also causes these large patches. But TACO disease caused by a fungal, uh, a fungal pathogen usually has this kind of melting symptom of the base of the um of the lawn of the of the blades and so you will see this necrosis kind of soft and mushy and it looks like it's melting and and that's typical symptom of take all root rot uh, disease quite common in our area and um very widespread and so now you kind of have an idea on how the lawn will look overall the symptoms in the field, but also how the symptoms will look when you take a quick and um, close look at the at the blades. So you will see that mosaic, the chlorosis. In terms of the field, you will see that generalized uh, yellowing and dieback. Now, we if you need to get the lawn diagnosed, um, the first thing would be, of course, to take a good sample. And so step number one is to take a sample that is symptomatic, okay? So these are examples of lawns infected with a disease and the arrows indicate where you are going to be taking the sample from. So we always recommend to go to the intersection of the lawn that is showing symptoms and the one that is recently showing symptoms, very early symptoms, or still healthy. And so you're going to take a square or silk circle uh, from those areas. Now, in the case of LVN, we have to be careful because, as I mentioned before, it can be a mix of grasses. So I have had clients bringing me a piece of the lawn, but it was just full of weeds. There was no grass. There was no you know, San Agustin grass. So be careful the sample that you take. Be sure to include the grass that you wanted to grow to begin with. Uh, and it's not just weeds covering that space. This is an example of a perfect sample. And you can see it has a lot of green tissue. It has a lot of living tissue. So for virus testing, we need living tissue because virus needs living host to persist, right? So if you bring me a dead dry leaf, I'm not gonna be able to test it. So we need enough tissue um, that is living, that is moist, that has that sap that we can extract and then perform the test. This is an example of a very, very good sample. Symptomatic, early symptoms, still green, still juicy and and um fresh this is these are just uh photos showing the symptoms again that broken mosaic symptom of chlorosis and yes this uh this turf this piece of um turf has some other symptoms like it's already dying back um on the older um leaves blades However, it still has enough green tissue to perform tests. This is also a good sample. So remember I told you we like to show you textbook photos, but that's not the reality. This is more of the samples that we get at the clinic where you see other symptoms. You already see in necrosis, you already see in dieback, but there is still green tissue to test. So even though this sample doesn't look as perfect as the one that I showed you at the beginning, it's still a very good sample for testing. Sometimes, I would say perhaps most of times, uh, we get samples with other diseases besides um, LVN. So this is a San Agustin uh, Floratum turf 
and it's not only suffering from LVN, but it also has root rot. You can see the discoloration of the root and uh, discoloration of the uh, base of the blades. So that's okay. As long as we have green tissue that is symptomatic, uh, we, can, we can move on with the testing. Please bring enough living tissue. I have to stress this a lot. Um, and this is a good example where you can see some dieback already and then uh, some of the, of the living tissue. So please include enough green tissue for the testing. Still good samples, even though a little bit thin, um, there's still some green tissue for testing. Now, how about this? These are not good samples, right? And I don't know who is in the audience. I hope I'm not, <laughs> you are not recognizing any of the samples that you have submitted to the clinic, but we have seen it all, right? So we have one, like the one at your left, still, you know, still we can do some testing, but if we want to retest or use a different technique, we won't have enough tissue. Uh, the, the one next to it, a lot of dead, a lot of um, perhaps take all disease, taking the rest of the of the turf. There is some symptomatic, still okay um, tissue to test, but it's really pushing it to to the limit. And then the three last, there is no way I can do pretty much anything to to with these samples. Uh, we can maybe look at the roots and and take some pH, some soil EC values, but you know, my help will be very limited towards um, these kind of samples. So please include enough um, living material. If you're taking a sample and send it by mail, try to do it quickly. If you are bringing the sample person in person, um, do it quickly. Don't leave it in your truck. Don't throw it, you know, to the front of your truck or to the pickup and um, leave it there under the sun to scorch or to decay, do not add any wetting or wet towels. If you're sending by mail, do not increase the humidity inside the package because that's just gonna accelerate the decay of the, of the turf. Photos are always welcome um, and not necessarily, you don't have to send, but it will really help us uh, match the field symptoms with the presence of the virus with the symptoms that we see on the blades and with the cultivar identification, right? So this is what is diagnosis. We have to put all these pieces together so we can tell you, yes, your lawn has LVN. And this is very important to follow all these procedures because the prognosis is not very good and uh, replacing the lawn, of course, is costly. So we wanna be sure that we are telling you um, an accurate diagnosis. So once you decide that you need help and then you want the experts to um, give you a diagnosis and do lab testing, you can send either to the turf clinic up in Gainesville or you can send it to the plant clinic here at the Tropical Research and Education Center in Homestead. We are open from eight to 12 and from one to five, we receive samples by mail as well. And very important in this case is to fill the form and give us your information. How can we send you the results? Um, this will be sent by email. And so, you know, putting all your information that is legible, that we can read it, uh, is very important. Very important to let us know what is the cultivar, right? Because I am not a turf expert. I cannot differentiate uh, between palmetto and floratan. I'm learning. I'm, I'm becoming better at it but I cannot make the call and say, this is for sure um, Floratan. So I would appreciate if you tell us uh, what it is. If you don't know, also put it, I don't know. So we take that into consideration. And, and again, uh, very important, don't let the sample degrade and send us fresh samples. So in general for turf diseases, such as stakel, Rhizoctonia, uh, all my seeds like Pitium, um, we do a lot of microscopy, we do a lot of plating, and that's straightforward. Now with viruses, uh, we can culture them uh, because they need a living host. 
and we cannot look at the microscope and see them. So um, they are only seen by very expensive um, equipment. There is a transmission electron microscope, but we don't have those um, equipment at the lab. And so we have to rely in serological tests. And I have been given this workshop since 2018 when we used to have um, usable test that it could be field deployed. And so I remember giving these workshops, sometimes on hands-on workshops where we will macerate the, the sample. And I was, you know, teaching you how to homogenize and break the tissue, kind of like a guacamole, making guacamole. And people were uh, bringing their samples and we were testing the samples uh, during the workshop, which was fantastic. And there was these serological tests, um, which are called immune strips, and they were sold by Actia. And then you could do that in the field. You could do that anywhere because they were pretty um, user-friendly. And in half an hour, you would see a positive or a negative result, just like a pregnancy test, right? It was very easy. Unfortunately, um, this company reinvented their immune strips because of other problems. And I'm glad they did because they were given uh, false positives for other um, potiviruses in other uh, hosts. But the bad news is that now it doesn't work for detecting uh, sugarcane mosaic virus in grass. And so it used to work because the sugarcane mosaic virus is a potivirus and this immune strip was able to detect potivirus. So we contacted the, the company because the immune strips were not working. Um, Gainesville was also involved in this and they reinvented it and now it doesn't work. So now we have to use a more time consuming test. It's also a serological test. It's an immunoassay called ELISA. You may have heard this uh, is used for um, HIV detection and some other human diseases detection. And so basically um, it's a lab method and it requires a bunch of um, supplies. And that is the reason we had to increase the, the price um, as Phil mentioned, and it's more laborious. So the immune strip worked in half an hour. It was not perfect. You had to uh, put the specific amount of tissue and it was kind of sensitive to mistakes. But now this one will take two days and it's a little bit more laborious, but we are able to do it at the clinic. Uh, we have implemented this and this uh, method, and this is how we look. Here we have a plate with the negative control, positive control. If it's positive, it's going to light up uh, yellow. And here you have sample number six that is positive. So um, the good thing is that it's more sensitive and, and is um, easier to read. I think that even though it's more time consuming, I'm happier with the results and I'm, I'm, um, I feel much more uh, confident on the results because it's more sensitive. The bad part is that it's only lab based, right? So you cannot do it in the field. Um, it will be just, you know, you will have to be there for, <laughs> for two days and, and doing incubations and, and so on. And so I have a lot of questions from clients about um, about other diseases co-occurring with LVN and how we do the diagnosis and which route we take in this diagnosis procedure. I hope I don't make you more confused. So bear with me. Uh, I, I was thinking of how to explain this in a visual way, a way that is easily understandable. Um, so let's see. Let's see that you come to the clinic and you have a St. Augustine grass. Um, if it's anything else that is not St. Augustine, I will go straight to plating, microscopy, and so on. Um, so if it's a St. Augustine grass, I will ask you, is it Floratum? And you will tell me, no, it's not. I'm sure that it's not. Um, or yes, I'm sure that it is. Or I don't know. And if the sample looks like a floratum um, and has mosaic symptoms, um, not necessarily necrosis, but mosaic symptoms, 
I will run the ELISA. Okay, I will I will take the time. We will make um prepare for the ELISA uh, method, and then the results will be either positive or negative. If they are negative, um, I will go into microscopy. So I'm gonna tell you what is causing um the problem in the turf. Uh, it could be tacol, it could be rhizotonia, all these other fungal diseases. Now, if the sample is positive and is symptomatic, so it has mosaic, um, then if if the sample is on top of that floratam and in the form you are stating that there is dieback, there is necros, there is necrosis seen in the field, and the sample matches the symptoms that we know are caused by the disease, then you will receive a report that says lethal viral necrosis. Okay, if the sample is symptomatic, let's say mosaic, um, and you don't know the cultivar, um, you will receive a report that says that sugarcane mosaic virus has been detected in your sample and that um, explaining a little bit about the biology of the disease and that, the, sorry, of the, of the virus that can cause the disease, and um, I will also do microscopy to see what else is going on. Because if it happens that you don't have fluoratam, um, the turf still has the hope to recover, right? So I want to tell you what other illness that turf may have so you can address those. So I hope that is <laughs> that is um, well explained. Uh, you can always send me an email or call the clinic if you need further explanation. And so some of the questions that I have is, um, or that I get are, does the presence of sugar cane mosaic virus, meaning that the ELISA test is positive, means that my lawn has LVN? So if, if your lawn is floratum and is symptomatic, then you do have LVN, okay? Those, those are the, the things that have to be checked for you to, to say the lawn has LVM. So what happens if I have another St. Augustine grass cultivar that tested positive for sugarcane mosaic virus? So the grass could develop mosaic symptoms as we have heard in the previous talk, but will not develop necrosis. So far, viruses change very quickly. So we always have to be researching, monitoring and following up, you know, um, of the changes that uh, it may happen in the future. So can my lawn have more than one disease? Yes, and usually they do. Um, so the question is, if you have a Floratan lawn that has been diagnosed with the presence of sugarcane mosaic virus or already LVN, um, is it worth to treat for other diseases? And I think this is a very, very important point that you have to talk to your clients, to your um, employer and start the mitigation strategy and how to um, you know, move forward because there is no cure and no treatment so far developed for this. So, you know, you will have to make that call and 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 know and be educated that there is no cure for this viral disease. Mm -hmm. And so there's lots of resources. Uh, you can go to the UF uh, website. There is a lot of information on the Palm Beach County website as well on LVN and how to address those issues, how to talk to your clients. Uh, you can send samples to the Rapid Turf grass diagnostic service, or you can come in person or send by mail to the Trek Plant Diagnostic Clinic, and we will provide you with an accurate uh, diagnosis, granted that you submit a good sample. And so with that, thank you for listening, and um, I'll take any questions. This is my contact information. That's the phone of the clinic. You may call whenever uh, you have any questions or need more information on how to submit a sample, how to pay for a sample, um, to interpret the results, the report, you can just give us a call.
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Garcis. I mean, amazing presentations. Um, uh, I think my brain is uh, exploded. <laughs> um, it's eight past the hour. Uh, I don't think we, I think all the questions uh, were answered. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Harmon. Uh, there is not too much time here for more questions. Um, so let me try to uh, launch the the post test. Uh, Back. Back. Stop sharing. Looks like it's not working. All right, what's this? All right. Uh, see you, um, you, we re, you are going to receive, and we are going to send the, the form. Uh, pesticide, see you, is uh, 1.5 and FNGLA. Uh, two CUs, uh, landscape inspectors. I don't know how many landscape inspectors are here. Uh, one CU. Uh, I just say uh, because this is not uh, related to any to trees, so they didn't uh, award us any ISA CUs. So only uh, pesticide, uh, FNGLA, and uh, landscape inspector. Um, the survey uh, really, really is important for us. We are going to, we are going to receive a, a link for the survey. Try to respond it uh, as much as you can. And also, um, we are going to uh, 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 send it to you uh, three months from now, so maybe April, May, uh, another survey uh, asking if you are following the recommendations, uh, for, uh, asking you several questions. It's very important for us to have to pick up this type of uh, information. So, uh, you know, guys, uh, I appreciate if you can help us um, compile information because our job depends on that. That's very simple. <laughs> All right, so 40%. Um, I know people are tired. Me too. I'm very tired now. But let me try to uh, end this poll here. Uh, two more seconds. Right. Share. Take a look. All right. Very good results here. Uh, Romina, Phil, you want to discuss any of these uh, the questions? Actually, I will. I will say bye. I have a doctor's appointment. I have to have to run. <laughs> but it was really nice. Hopefully, um, you guys um learn more or reinforce the knowledge that you already had. And you can always contact the clinic if you need any help uh, regarding uh, turf health. And very nice to see you guys. Thank you very much. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Uh, I know it's uh, past the hour, but thank you very much and uh, be safe. Uh, happy holidays. Bye.